Hi, I'm your host, Vasco Duarte. Welcome to the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast, where we share tips and tricks from Scrum Masters around the world. Every day, we bring you inspiring answers to important questions that all Scrum Masters face day after day. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Wednesday, the Leading Change episode this week with Matthew Green. Hey, Matthew, welcome back. Hey, Vasco. Nice to be back. So, Matthew, on Wednesdays, we dive into change. We already talked a little bit about it on Monday, but we want the story of a change process now, and we really want to dig deeper into the story of that change process. And then as you go through the steps that you went through at that time, highlight for us the tips, the tricks, the techniques, the tools you learned back then that you still apply today. Well, I think I'm going to tell a tale of two companies without naming the companies because I learned a lot of how not to do it at one company, and it's allowed me to take those lessons and apply them in a better way at another company. So but company number one, the, the tale of woe, so to speak, is a, a, a large company that I was working at that wanted to transform to a new way of working. They had very much had blinders on and they were all about maturity and we can just measure how mature the teams are and that tells us how we how things are so their their point of view was very much at a let's make sure that the it teams change and none of this applies to anybody else so they're they're sort of stuck in this microcosm so when i run in when i walk into the teams it was sort of like we talked about the other day Scrum was being done to these teams. They were being told, go do this, go do this framework. And then what we started running into was all of the anti-patterns that prevented the teams from even being successful and changing because nothing was being done. It was still a prioritization through escalation environment. So it doesn't matter what was happening in the sprint. If the right vice president was tapped on the shoulder, the team immediately had to stop what they were working on and start working on something else. They weren't allowing teams to keep their agency or to keep their structure. And you'd have multiple instances of people being shared across teams or having roles that are outside of the team that they had to do in addition to the work that they had to do inside of the team. And so it was sort of this thought process of, you know, it's just something that's done just to the teams in the IT division. That's the only people that need to change. So it's that whole story of incomplete change, especially from a leadership level. I don't have to change how I work, but we're going to get all this benefit because the teams are going to change, not me. Yeah, it's definitely, I've heard of that anti-pattern a lot, right? Like <laughs> we're all adopting agile, except only the teams have to change, but everybody else stays the same. Yeah, we even saw it in the training. We, we collected during the training, during the training phase of working at this company, we collected 350 yes buts or scrum buts at the back of the room. Because as we were saying, this is what agile and scrum is. People were saying, but that's not the way it works here. So we actually started collecting it so that we could say, okay, here's all the here's all the data that your teams are telling you that are preventing them from working the way you're asking them to work and try to take that back to leadership and say, we need your help with this. But what that was met with was, ah, just make them do it. So the, the other side of the story is a different company, still a large company, but they recognized that you can't just come in and train teams and then have the tra- have the people walk away. So they needed somebody to help the teams continue to grow. And so taking the lessons of you know why things didn't work at company one to company two, one of the biggest absences that I found was a lack of community. So we have all of these individuals spread all over and, and change is contagious. But if you don't put people where they can catch it, they don't catch it. So one of my first things that was important was to start creating community. So we created first a Scrum Master Guild where we could get all of the Scrum Masters in the organization together and talk about what's working and what's not working and create an environment of learning where they can learn from each other and create an informal of an informal health network so that when I'm running into a problem, I know who are the other people that I can go to and talk to did the same thing for product owners. We now hold a 
monthly lean coffee for everybody in the organization where we can just come and talk about stuff regardless of rank or position and, or any of that. And we've also evolved that into a leadership guild where we've created that same type of community for leaders to be able to come and ask questions about what does this mean for me? Because that's probably the biggest takeaway from the earlier organization is, is there's a vast amount of training and knowledge that's focused on the people that are building. I actually like calling them builders rather than developers now, because I think it it has a better context for a lot of people, but the leaders very rarely get much in the way of anything in training and don't know how their lives are to be, are going to be changed by this. So we created that leadership guild where we could start having those conversations and answering those questions and building up that knowledge base to allow people to safely ask questions about what does this mean to me? And it's amazing how much a little communication solves a lot of problems. Yeah, absolutely. The first thing that comes to mind when I think about community is the, uh, of course, it helps with communication. Obviously, you get everybody together. It, it's easier to communicate. If they ask questions, you clarify the communication. But there's also the other aspect, which is the sense of a shared journey, right? The idea that we are not alone in this learning, in this transformation, what other aspects do you think community, creating these communities, have helped within the change process? I think what it's done for most is it's actually done a lot for creating that safety net, that, that psychological safety. We talk a lot about psychological safety in, in the Agile community, which really is just another word for trust, at least in terms of the way I look at it. And it's a visible form of People, I can trust that people aren't going to punish me for having opinions that are different than others. It actually is a scrum master as, as, as an agilist where we need to lead by example and we need to exhibit the behaviors that we want to see in others. It gives me an opportunity to actually demonstrate that and potentially put some unpopular decisions out into the air and let people see that, wow, Matt just said that, and I've been thinking it, and nobody came up and did something bad to him. He's still here. And that creates an immense, I don't know if it's immense, but it creates a confidence of, wow, maybe I can do that too. And the whole the, the whole organization sort of levels up in its transparency when that happens. Yeah, absolutely. It gives us the opportunity also to lead by example, right? Like you just gave an example in the Scrum Master community. It's okay to have opinions that don't go like the Scrum book or the Scrum guide defines, right? It's okay. Absolutely. And, and that's important because there's a lot of people that take the Scrum guide as the official rule book for how things should be done. No, <laughs> it, it, it defines what scrum is. And if you're, if you're not doing, you know, if you, if you cut off major arms or legs of it, yeah, you're probably not doing scrum, but it doesn't mean that you're necessarily doing something wrong. It just means you're not doing scrum. I always go back to the, the same thing and it fits into this community thing, which is scrum doesn't fix your problems. It shows you your problems and it's your responsibility to fix it. And these communities are great places to talk about that in a very open way because you know a lot of people are in that mindset of well we're doing scrum so we must be agile but if we're agile why do we have all this pain and it, it gives us an opportunity to talk about okay if you're a self-managing self-organizing team what is your responsibility to fix the things that you find especially in enterprise level organizations, there's so many people that are actually in the trenches doing the building that have been programmed to just do what they're told. That when you start to bring in this idea that they actually have agency and have the ability to make a choice about how to do something or when to do something or what to do, they're surprised. And they actually sort of get shocked because they haven't been given that opportunity before. It's like putting a two-year-old in a, in a room full of candy and telling them to pick one. <laughs> okay, so before we finish off, there's another aspect that I wanted to touch on that comes from this sense of community that we want to build by building those different communities. And, and that was the idea of empathy, 
change requires a, a great deal of empathy, right? Because things are not going to happen right the first time. We're, we're learning. Also, people will have different perspectives, like you illustrated. And for me, creating community is also an opportunity for us to create the space for empathy to grow, right? Like you go back to your team and you hear something that some other Scrum Master already heard and talked to you about in the Scrum Master community. And you go like, ha, huh, now I know what this is about. And we don't need to react to what is said. We can think and understand why it's there. And then we can act based on that and not just jump into reacting with, you know, to the things that team members say all the time. Oh, absolutely. And that's really... You know, there's two ways to get Scrum Masters. You can either grow them or buy them, and buying them is expensive. So one of the things that I'm hoping this can be working with this community, one of the, our hopes is, is that it gives us the ability to grow as a Scrum Master. And as we talked about earlier, you go to the class, the class teaches you the mechanics, but it doesn't teach you the art of Scrum Mastery. So it doesn't teach you how to show up using meta skills. Sometimes, it, you know, learning those types of things of what does my team need from me type of questions, which do they need empathy? Yeah, sometimes that's what they need. They just need somebody to, to, to be there for them in that way. Sometimes they need you as a scrum master to show up with curiosity because that enables them to be curious. And sometimes they need you to show up as something else. They may need you to show up more as a, you know, they need to show up more focused because they need focus because of whatever the challenge is in front of them. So these communities help you develop all of those meta skills and understand where to apply them based upon the circumstance of the team. That's a great point. And I, I really like the meta skills concept that you just described. So thank you for sharing that, Matthew. Yep. Leading change is one of the core skills we must acquire, but it is only one of the steps towards our success as Scrum Masters. Tomorrow, on Success Thursday, we will talk about how to define success for the Scrum Master role, we'll cover tips on how to measure your way to that position, and most importantly, how to develop that focus on continuous improvement that is as important for Scrum Masters as it is for teams. See you tomorrow. We really hope you liked our show. And if you did, why not rate this podcast on Stitcher or iTunes? Share this podcast and let other Scrum Masters know about this valuable resource for their work. Remember that sharing is caring. 